Mm. Uh, if you are ready. Very good. If you are ready. Many thanks. So again, on behalf of the um, on behalf of the European Union section of the Association of the Hungarian Economists, I warmly welcome you, Mr. Ambassador. Um, and many thanks for having accepted uh, our uh, invitation. And uh, we are very curious about uh, what you will share with us about uh, the uh, the priorities of the Portuguese presidency. The expectations are high. We are living exceptional time, times, exceptional circumstances to act, to decide. And uh, expectations of the citizens are quite high. Not, it's not just... Uh, a kind of political expectation, but it's a quite, a, I would say, general expectation around the, uh, the amongst the member states and um, around the citizens. Um, uh, Mr. Ambassador, we, we have had a little opportunity to see uh, the program of your presidency. Um, it's a very nicely designed uh, list of priorities, but uh, we would be very much uh, interested um, um, in your views, in your interpretation how you see what are the most important uh, objectives of the of the pre of the presidency we all, we appreciate if you if you have a look at the level of the eu uh, but also if you would address um, those issues which might be maybe more interesting for hungary that you also very much appreciate and now Thank i will you. invite you to take the floor and after your introduction i will open the floor to our colleagues uh, to put questions and I apologize to the colleagues that uh, we, we cannot make this interview in, in Hungarian, although the ambassador speaks uh, uh, some Hungarian. Uh, he greeted us uh, Hungarian when we had the, our little chat, um, but we will run this uh, discussion in English. So, Mr. Ambassador, many thanks again. The floor is yours. Köszönöm szépen. Thank you very much, Igor. Thank you, thank you, Ivan. Th thank you very much. And um, it's for me an honor to be speaking with us for a society of Hungarian economists. Uh, Hungarian economists have are famous all worldwide. I think that the most famous avenue here in Budapest, Andrashi. I think Andrashi, apart from everything he did, I think he was an economist also. So, economists in Hungary certainly have a very strong heritage to fill. And I apologize because I only have the Portuguese flag behind me. I'm at home and I don't have uh, the, the only European Union flag I have is too big to put in this room. So I really apologize. It's nothing against the institutions. I'm fully European and uh, I'm very happy to be here with you to share about our presidency. It's going to be, unfortunately, and due to the times, it's going to be more an academic exercise than exactly we are going to do this and we are going to do that. You asked uh, what are our expectations at the end of this semester. I think that if we have, have managed to flatten the curve of the pandemic, if we have managed to vaccinate the maximum number of people in our countries, I think that only that is a success. If nothing else is done, if only that is done, it is a success, a success in, in itself. I'm happy to know that you um, that you have followed the objectives of the Portuguese uh, presidency. Uh, basically, they have three priorities. One is the economic recovery of uh, of our countries. The other is uh, the social aspects uh, linked to this uh, to make uh, Europe more social and more 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 social for our for our citizens and also to open the the doors of uh, of the world to us in order to um, to find alternatives for our for our foreign relations um, there are many things which we want to do during this semester which i do not know if it will be possible one is obviously the conference on the future of europe i know that the hungarian authorities are very much uh, prepared for this are prepared to uh, to make uh, sort of town halls to involve uh, civilian institutions to involve the citizens but unfortunately it's an exercise which cannot be done virtually so we have to cross our fingers and hope that the uh, situation gets better so that we may may enter this uh, this um, this uh, this phase um, we 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 have um, we have managed uh, or we have designed our 
our presidency, uh, the recovery of the union with five, five components. One is a more resilient Europe, a more social Europe, a more green Europe, a more digital Europe, and a more global Europe. All these are tied, but uh, each one has its own uh, its own aspects which we would like to to um, to develop. Uh, for a resilient Europe, it's obviously uh, the recovery of our economies. Uh, you, as economists, you have certainly made. Uh, many thoughts on uh, what our economies will be uh, after this pandemic or during this pandemic. The situation is not good. Many people are losing their jobs. Many people will have Portugal, for instance, we live, uh, our GDP is almost 20% tourism and tourism is one of the sectors which has been uh, literally killed by, by this pandemic. So uh, we will have to find ways in which our, our workers and our citizens will be able to find alternatives for, 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 their, uh, for their lives and for their, um, uh, their, their, the monies that they, their wages and, and, and all that. Uh, we want the multilateral, um, the, the multinational, um, pardon, the multi-annual, uh, financial framework to be implemented as soon as possible. We want the tools of the next generation programs to be to be installed as soon as possible. We hope that this procedure will find consensus in the parliaments of all the member states, and that we may at, at the end of the semester have all this uh, of all this going. After all, it's an urgent uh, recovery program, so we really cannot. Uh, we cannot wait too long for this uh, for this to happen. We need to promote growth. We need to promote job creation, and uh, and we need to restore and deepen the internal market and all the tools that we have at our at our d disposal. Um, we want to, uh, and this has a lot to do with the conference on the future of Europe. We want to strengthen the democracy, the rule of law, the human rights, the fundamental freedoms. We want to improve our response to critical situations like the one we're living. The sector of health is something in which we will have to look very attentively. We will have to strengthen. We see that uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, things weren't quite right. We see now today, that with the vaccination programs, things aren't going as we wanted them to. Uh, Europe needs to unite itself in different ways than it has in the past. Uh, we lived uh, 2020 of division, of issues of division, and we need to concentrate now on things that will unite us and that will help us move, uh, move uh, forward. When we talk about resilient, uh, we we would like again. These are things which are on the table, but we don't know if it will be possible. We want uh, the Horizon Europe program, which joins scientists and entrepreneurs, innovation. We want we would like that to to have a, a high level meeting in Lisbon. I don't know if that will be possible. We would like a EU recovery pro conference in, in May, June, again, in Lisbon. We don't know if that will be possible. And then the social Europe, we want to strengthen our social dim dimension. Uh, we want to respond actively to the crisis and we want to promote an, 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 inclusive, uh, an inclusive growth. Uh, there is a lot of social e exclusion going on. Uh, this pandemic has shown a lot of frailties in our societies, and we need to get together to strengthen and to promote and to find ways to respond to all these challenges, which are very, very big and very, very demanding. Again, we would like to have, uh, as you know, uh, a social summit in Porto in May, uh, I, again, don't know if how things will be that way, but uh, it will be a summit with huge significance for our economic recovery and also for the transition, which we talk about in digital and in climate, uh, in climate uh, issues. Climate issues, which brings us to the, to the Green Europe. Uh, we want to implement the European climate law. We want to achieve the 
2030 and the 2050 targets that have been decided upon. We want to promote the European Green Deal. We want to strengthen the energy transition. As you know, Portugal has done a lot in the last decades concerning alternative energies. Um, we want to complete the common agricultural policy, difficult as it uh, as it may be, but we need innovation, we need dig digitalization, we need sustainable management of all the natural resources that um, uh, that we have in our rural world. Again, we wanted uh, summits, conferences. We would like to have in June in the Azores a sustainable oceans conference. Again, these are things which right now are only on, on paper. And digital Europe, this has also Portugal, for instance, we would like to have, um, now that the schools have closed, we would like to have uh, um, um, uh, online uh, classes for all students. And we see that the frailties exist, that uh, it is not possible to have online classes for all students because not all students have uh, the hardware at their at their disposal. So we need to strengthen uh, uh, each one nationally in, in, in this sector. We want to make Europe, uh, I don't know if uh, becoming a world leader is wanting too much, but we at least need to give our citizens the instruments uh, to promote uh, this connectivity uh, that we all um, that we all wish for. This is the digi digital Europe again. We would like uh, a high level conference uh, to be confirmed. Uh, there are issues. There are meetings planned in all this area, but uh, probably, <laughs> as the name is, they will be digital and not uh, and not presential. Uh, and then the global Europe, um, uh, the Treaty of Lisbon, in which I was personally involved in in 2007, uh, it has taken a lot of the responsibilities for our external policy from the presidencies. But still, we would like to help. Uh, we would like to help the European Union to strengthen its multilateralism and its global uh, partnerships. Uh, we have the United Kingdom, and I think it's very important. And in this situation of the vaccination, a lot can be said about Brexit and the implications of Brexit in our, in our lives. Uh, we want to have a summit with Narendra Modi, the Prime Minister of India. We would like to have it in May in Porto, uh, India. I don't need to, to talk about the importance. I was actually ambassador of India two embassies ago, so I, it's a country I know I know. Quite, quite well, um, but it's alternatives in the in the in the foreign uh, sphere that we would like to develop. We would like also to strengthen Africa. Um, there will not be in our presidency the EU Africa Summit, uh, but we have um, high level meetings with uh, the African Union, which we would like to implement in in this semester, namely regarding migration and regarding uh, trade. Um, so basically. Um, and of course, also the Eastern Partnership, the enlargement. These are these are issues which uh, we were we are very happy to develop. So, in a nutshell, this is uh, it's more an academic um, an academic exercise right now, in terms of uh, in terms of objectives, because many of these issues will need uh, person to person contact, which is obviously difficult or impossible right now. Uh, but to, to come back to what I said before, uh, the big objective, and I think that we're talking about the conference on the future of Europe. I mean, we have to look at the present of Europe right now before thinking about its future. And, uh, and if we were able at the end of the semester to flatten the curve of the pandemic, have our populations uh, uh, vaccinated and have a more normal life and a safer life in our union, I think those would be objectives which would in itself uh, merit the whole presidency. I think I give the floor to you again, Igor. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. That was a very clear uh, vision. Thank you very much uh, for it. It's with a quite a challenging semester, uh, with a challenging political agenda under uh, exceptional circumstances. Uh, 
uh, what else you would like to, to wish for a, for a presidency to be, to be tested. No, but indeed, um, you have a very um, uh, well-designed program with clear uh, issues to, to tackle. Um, I think uh, the, uh, the reception of your program was very positive, at least here in the European institutions, but I'm sure that also in, in Budapest. Um, now, I ask uh, my colleagues uh, whether anyone would like to, to ask a question. You can either use uh, the raising hand uh, function of the of the application, or uh, use the chat uh, forum to to put a question, or just indicate that you would like to have a question, and I will give the floor uh, to you. So, who would be the icebreaker? You know, ah, yes, uh, I, I I so maybe ladies first. Orshoya, Orshoya Siartu, who is a member of the presidency of the of the section on European Affairs. Orshoya, please. Orshoya, you are muted. Hello. Yes, I see two further. <clears throat> I will take notes who is taking the floor. Hello. Yes. Yes. Okay, you hear me. Yeah, thank you, Your <laughs> Excellency, for your detailed and uh, in, uh, really detailed uh, presentation. Um, I was struck by the social dimension which you mentioned, and I'm really happy that uh, we as the European Union will address this topic together. Uh, I just wanted to ask your personal view. What is your view? How, how can we strengthen Europe on the social level, which is at the moment mostly treated at the national level? But what is your expectations in terms of this? Thank you very much. You want me to answer? Um, we don't take questions. Okay, very good. Yes, please. Yes, I see please. that you have the same surname of the Hungarian foreign minister. I don't know if you are related. <laughs> no, I'm not. But um, I'm be the ambassador to the Netherlands from Hungary. So very good, very good. But without any relationship to my boss. Very good. For <laughs> Nadja No, uh, I know that uh, I know, and uh, particularly to the Hungarian authorities, this is an issue which. Uh, um, uh, which merits some discussion because uh, um, in many people's views uh, it is issues, uh, things like uh, minimum wage, things like that. It's something, competence of the of the um, of each member state and not be to be uh, given by or ordered, so to say, by 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 Brussels. But still, I mean, even if we don't go that way, there are many things which socially can be can be done. I mean, um, the European pillar of social rights, uh, stronger or weaker, should have a concrete meaning meaning in 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 citizens uh, in citizens' um, lives, uh, and we would like to um, to use the, the the summit and to use all the work that goes into the summit uh, towards the implementation of uh, the relevant Commission's action plan and to the implementation of the of the concrete things of the uh, of the pillar. I think the pillar's central role is the pillar has a central role in Europe's recovery and in its adaptation to all the transitions that uh, that are going to be needed in this um, in this moment of our of our common of our common lives i think it will be an opportunity um, i'm not talking about the results i'm talking about the process it will be an opportunity to strengthen the dialogue uh, with social partners with citizens and there are areas like employment, like jobs, like equal opportunities, like inclusion, like diversity, like social protection, like health, especially health, which will have to take uh, center stage. Our, our societies right now are confused. 
uh, our societies right now don't really know what the future is going to bring. And I think that it's an opportunity for the European Union, for the institutions to give a bit of guidance and to give a bit of leverage uh, to the aspirations of our of our citizens. There is a lot of social exclusion that is going on in my country, uh, social exclusion. And I just talked about, for instance, I just talked about the, um, the, the need for, for, for computers, uh, small things, computers for, for every child. Uh, those uh, that don't have feel uh, socially excluded from the others. Uh, this pandemic has shown a lot of gaps and a lot of differences in our societies which need to be mended and they all belong to the social field. So we need to pay attention to, um, to all this inequality, in inequality, to all this discrimination. We need policies that address better the poverty and, and the exclusion. We need to protect vulnerable groups. Um, and there is a need, and again, I, I, I underline the aspects of health because health belongs to the social, uh, the social sector. Uh, we need a, a stronger, enhanced cooperation between member states in in this area. We need we need to enhance the responsiveness of our health services. We we need to have better answers to public health threats. Uh, things have not been going well. Uh, uh, each member state has been pulling uh, for itself. Uh, there has been uh, a little lack of solidarity, if I want to be euphemistic, uh, in this sector. So I think that in the social, I mean, uh, we don't have to look at the social just at, at minimum wages or at things that can be a bit more discussable. There are many areas in the social field in which uh, we can promote uh, we could promote a better living for, for our citizens. And I think that uh, it will be important for the, 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 social, uh, the social groups and the, the citizens to be able to express a bit of their concerns, and a bit of their, their wants in this field. Uh, and I think that it's an exercise which is uh, relevant in the times that we are living. I totally agree with you, and I, I'm very happy that you are going to address this topic. But it's also, also it's a very ambitious program. To I know, I yeah. know. <laughs> I wish you a lot of uh, success and strength. For well, us. it's not up to me. I'm here in Budapest. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, but you know, I mean, uh, this uh, this pandemic has shown a lot of frailties in societies which we thought that were strong and vibrant and all this. And uh, we need to calm things down in the sense of giving a bit more uh, assurances to, to our citizens, which they don't have right now. Okay, thank you so much for your, mm -hmm. thank you. Thank, thank you very much. I have seen uh, three hands raised and three questions uh, put. Let's start with those who raise their hands. I try to follow the order of appearance. The first one, I think, was uh, Gergő Horváth. Gergő, the floor is yours. Uh, sorry, it was uh, on purpose. <laughs> it's, it was not on purpose. OK. Hello? Then, sorry. Yes. Uh, who is that? Do you, do you, did you have to address me or? or? Uh. No, the first was Gergő Horvat, and now I see you, Miklos Horvat. I am Miklos Horvat, yes. not oh, Gerd. No. Sorry, sorry, then I mixed up my name, so... But uh, the floor is yours, Miklos. Sorry, uh, uh, dear Ambassador, first of all, thank you for your speech, and we got a little bit an inside view of what you are planning, and I would like to ask or add uh, two proposals or questions. One is relates to digital Europe. Uh, uh, there is currently, uh, there is no any regulation or common consensus about uh, how we should deal with the fake, new, fake news or generally what inf whether an information can be verified or non-verified. And, and I think it's a growing problem for, for society, business and politics as well. So 
currently, let's say Facebook has a, has its own system, what they use and when they use, and it, it creates also more confusion. And I think it, it would be the right time to start to negotiate among the member countries or let's say inside Europe, uh, what can be, how it can be regulated for the future because so it's a it's a growing huge problem. This is the one. The second that how we see that the COVID is the is the really the first global pandemic in the in the modern history. So it's real global and and it it it, it impacts everybody and and that would be interesting for the business. What I see that large companies started already to take the lessons and started to refurbish a little bit their business model. So that the it means that generally that the future most likely not will be the same as before. So there will be definitely changes in cus customer behavior, in even the, in the production. So so there is everywhere, and it would be interesting to analyze these impacts and what are the lessons and what uh, what should be done so this is the two areas you know if you allow well you know i've been suspended by facebook twice already for ridiculous reasons so i can yeah. I, I can empathize with with the need to uh, to regulate something but it's uh it's a difficult uh, discussion they are private companies uh, they are social media, but they are private companies. And I think that uh, a need, uh, it is necessary to find a balance between uh, what we can impose and what we can't, what we can't impose, or unless we go the way that some countries have gone and ban altogether social media and solve the problem right away. I think it's something, I mean, I'm really, honestly, I'm not uh, too uh, proficient in this, uh, in this area. But I think that it's uh, it's necessary for um, for Europe, for our countries, to have uh, discussions with those that manage the the social media and that manage uh, the the outlets that uh, sometimes uh, promote uh, fake news and provoke discussions and provoke dissensions. I think it's important to find, uh, uh, so to say. Uh, uh, <clears throat> A level level playing field in which uh, we we can all uh, we can all agree agree upon. I to be honest, I don't know exactly what we propose in this. Uh, I've been looking here at my papers. I don't know exactly what we are proposing to do with these giants of the social social media. Uh, apart from the fact that they uh, uh, they aren't European, the, most of them are are from other nationalities. They're not European, so it's a it's an issue which should be done uh, uh, without uh, creating dissension, but also without allowing uh, too much of what is bad going on. Uh, honestly, I think this is something that has in 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 terms of um, in terms of the digital um, of, of the digital um, aspect of our of our of our program. Uh, we want to 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 strengthen the 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 digital service we want to promote them uh but at the same time we want also to strengthen their resilience we want to strengthen cybersecurity and absolutely combat uh, disinformation i think there is an action plan for european democracy something called like that uh, it's a directive which uh, which intends to uh, to try and combat this disinformation which as uh, we all know uh, is something quite uh, quite difficult to 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 achieve. Thank you very much. Uh, um, the questions what I have, I will uh, give the floor in the order of appearance. Uh, first, I have uh, Miklos Nagy, then uh, Tomas Holm, and then afterwards Jord Becsei. And uh, may I invite you, dear, dear colleagues, just to introduce yourself shortly. So, Miklos, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency. Uh, I'm, I am the head of the Secretariat of the Hungarian Economic Association. 
I have two uh, questions. One is uh, to your excellency. What are your uh, expectations to the Biden administration? How the EU-US relationship uh, going on uh, this year? Uh, and then another one is uh, how the COVID pandemic affected the Portuguese economy. Thank you very much. Well, I'll start with the last one. Unfortunately, uh, it is having a, a huge impact on our on our economy. Like I mentioned, tourism is uh, is to almost twenty percent of our GDP. There are no tourists right now in Portugal. Uh, flights from many countries. Um, uh, we have a big po Brazilian uh, community in Portugal. We have huge uh, commercial interests with Brazil and. Uh, Right now, the flights to and from Brazil have totally been suspended. So, I mean, these are, you go to Lisbon, if you know New Lisbon in the good times, I mean, it was a, a, a city in which it was difficult to find someone speaking Portuguese. And right now it's a deserted city. So uh, tourism has a, a huge multiplying effect in many sectors of the economy. So uh, things are not not good. Uh, it's difficult to to make a transition uh, from tourism to some other sector. I mean, uh, things aren't done at the push of uh, at the push of a button. Restaurants are closed. Many commerce uh, hotels are empty. Uh, much commerce is uh, is. Uh, is dying so uh, i really don't know what the future of this will be so again it's uh it's the need that we need uh, first we need the 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 recovery funds in order to be able to sustain some of this uh, some of this sector but then we need to find alternatives we may we need to make uh job transitions we, we need to make sector transitions i know this is all very nice on paper, but uh, it's very difficult uh, to achieve because uh, we're not automats, people are not robots and uh, things don't happen in such an automatic way. Um, so I would say that uh, the impact is, uh, is severe. Um, the, the, the effects that will, this will have in the near future are still very difficult to, um, uh, to uh, evaluate. Uh, we just need to stop this pandemic as soon as possible in order to have some breathing space, no pun intended. Um, but the effect is big, uh, and I think it's big in in in, in other in other in other member states. Spain uh, obviously is a greater, a bigger country and has other economic alternatives. But again, it also lives off tourism. Uh, here in Budapest, it's horrible to see all the restaurants closed. It's horrible to see the Danube without any any boats uh, with tourists uh, sailing by. So I think this is something which has a huge impact. And I'm sure that many families, many citizens, thousands of families and thousands of citizens have are very anguished about their future because uh, they don't seem to have one right now. And I think it's it's an obligation, not necessarily just of the presidency. I think it's an obligation of all the European Union to get together and find ways. And again, this is the social aspect to find ways to uh, to relieve uh, the citizens of this anguish and to find alternatives that may give them a future with a bit more more optimism. Um, and speaking of optimism, of course, the relations with the new Biden administration um, are what it is. I mean, we know what the what the last four years were, uh, but um, President Biden has already given signs that he wants to change things. He's coming back to the to the Paris uh, Agreement. He's coming back to to the UN institutions. Uh, Everything will not necessarily be again automatic. Uh, uh, the United States is also going through a big crisis and also has to evaluate its its priorities. Um, the Brexit will certainly also have an impact on our relations because obviously having having the UK uh, within the European Union gave us a bit more leverage in 
in our relations with the United States, but I think there is reason for optimism. I think we have four years ahead in which uh, we can work together in a different way, or we can work together because we really haven't been working together in the last few years. And I think that um, that there is reason for optimism, and uh, and that the United States may may find its its way into the society of nations, so to say, in a different way than it has in the past. Obrigado. Yes, no. Your Excellency, everyone speaks Portuguese here. Yes, I speak a little Hungarian, so we're all good. Right. Very, well, very well, Mr. Ambassador. Okay, the, the next question will be by uh, Tomás Holm. Mm -hmm. The floor is yours. Thank you, Thank you so much, Gabor. Um, His Excellency mentioned among the priorities of the Portuguese presidency the enlargement of the European Union, which took me by some surprise. It is obvious that for Hungary, uh, the enlargement towards the Western Balkan is a priority. But why is it a priority for Portugal? And do you think in general that enlargement is now a timely issue? We can remember the Juncker presidency, that Juncker announced at the beginning of his term that uh, during his term there would not be any enlargement. Do you think that things are now different and is the time ripe for enlargement? Thank you. I apologize if I didn't mention enlargement. It doesn't mean that it's not a priority. Um, I, I, uh, there are many things I didn't talk about because, I mean, there are many things and there are many, uh, many vectors in, in the presidency. And I'm sorry if I didn't mention this one. Of course, enlargement is a priority. Enlargement is... Uh, is an important we want to uh, to bring to our bosom as uh, as many member states as we can we want to enlarge and enlarge the the common market and we want to make a a, a better life for all those that are in the european uh, continent i don't know if it's the right time right now i don't know if uh, enlargement negotiations will have any result during this presidency uh, europe is very much uh, closed in on itself right now uh, closed in on its problems, and uh, uh, and I don't know if even those that want to join the European Union, <laughs> they they would want to join right now. Uh, I think it's something that we will give. It. I mean, there are meetings planned uh, uh, for the Western Balkans. There are meetings planned uh, regarding enlargement, and it's something that obviously we will not um, we will not uh, say say no to. Um, uh, the relations with us between the European Union and our southern neighbors, so to say, is something which is very much in 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 our, in our concerns, and we are we are going to uh, we are going to to follow them. Uh, the time in this semester for enlargement, I don't think so, but it doesn't mean that we shouldn't make steps towards that objective, and I hope that we can. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. The next one is, is Jord Becei. Jord, please. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, Your Excellency, I am Vice Chair of this uh, committee of this section. So uh, I'm Jord Becei. I was earlier a member of the European Parliament and, and uh, State Secretary for Foreign Economic Issues. My question is very simple. You are ambassador in Budapest. and. Uh, I think that you try to think over that what will be the Hungarian side relations to your Portuguese presidency program, where Hungary can be a little bit sensitive and where Hungary can be active. I, I think that you have thought it over and I would be very happy to hear some views about this of yours. Thank you. Well, I think that Hungary can be can be helpful in all areas. I mean, Hungary is as important a member state as any other, uh, despite some differences that may exist between Hungary and other member states. It doesn't mean that Portugal will not will not uh, try to uh, to be a, an honest broker in any discussions. Uh, one is obviously, I mean, it's publicly known the the issues which uh, Hungary feels. Uh, uh, feels more concerned about. Uh, one is migration. Uh, today, for instance, there was to be uh, a council of uh, interior ministers in Lisbon. It's happening virtually, and I think that they are 
going to discuss the the migration uh, the migration package again it's something uh, we know what the what the hungarian concerns in, in this area are and again i don't know if it's something that can be discussed uh, online uh, it, again it's a negotiation that uh, involves corridor conversations and uh, and it will be very difficult to achieve uh, a clean result if it's only if it's only uh, online um, the other is the social i mentioned before the question regarding uh, the social the social issues we know that uh, hungary feels uh, has certain positions regarding uh, certain aspects of the social package uh, namely those that it believes uh, belong belongs to to the to the governments and not to and not to the institutions, uh, the minimum wage, etc. But it's something that, uh, unfortunately, like I said, it's it's difficult to discuss these things uh, online. But Portugal will be an honest broker. Portugal is not in these in this in these discussions with uh, with a firm position that it wants to impose on anyone. Uh, what we will try is to make a bridge between uh, between differing differing positions and try to see, achieve uh, a, a consensus. We did this 13 years ago with the Treaty of Lisbon, which was also something which involved a lot of negotiation and then a lot of uh, contrasting positions. So that will be, I mean, we don't come into this presidency, and I'm not an ambassador in Budapest, with any preconceived uh, any preconceived ideas my my mission here is to strengthen the relations between portugal and hungary uh, the presidency is just something that is happening on the way uh, and i will do my best certainly to try and uh, and create a consensus building approach to any issue that uh, that services i i have full respect for for the hungarian positions as i have for other position uh, it's their position um, and they have certainly reasons to to defend it so it's the obligation of the presidency to find uh, to find a path that uh, will mitigate the differences and will create a, a common approach many thanks many thanks your excellency the next one on my list is uh, Laszlo Vajda, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Ambassador, my name is Laszlo Vajda. I used... <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I used to work in the Ministry of Agriculture for several decades, including 20 years dealing European agricultural issues. And uh, my question relates to the common agricultural policy which uh, should have started on January of this year, but it was delayed because there was no agreement. As far as I know, the trilogue is just going on on the common agricultural policy. What is uh, the aim of the Portuguese presidency? How far you wish to come with the negotiation of the trilogue on the common agricultural policy? Thank you. Thank you. Well, our objective would be to complete the the reform of the of the common agricultural policy. I know it's an exercise due to one member state. I know it's an exercise which is very very difficult. The common agricultural policy has always been uh, a thorn in many people's backs, but I think that it's necessary to reform and to complete this this reform if it will be possible. I really. I really am not um, not sure, but we will we will try to um, we will try to implement this. We want to do the innovation, uh, uh, a sustainable in management of the natural resources in our in our rural world. We want to strengthen the food security, the supply chains. Uh, this pandemic has also brought brought to the surface a lot of things that need to be mended in the terms of uh, providing food to to our populations in uh, in more difficult uh, more difficult times so i mean this is all uh, tied in it's tied in with uh, with forest management with uh, with uh, water management with biodiversity with climate change uh, a blue economy i mean it's 
something that really needs to be be looked at if it's the desire of other member states to we will push as far as we can but it really as you know depends also on the desire of other member states to pursue this um, this path with uh, with with strength and with purpose so uh, we will do what we can uh, let's see what the reactions will be thank you thank you very much dear colleagues any any other questions please Uh, Mr. Ambassador, if there are no other questions, then I, I will put a question. Uh, Resilience is, uh, is very high on the agenda, and rightly so. Uh, all the economies, I mean, all the economy of, of every member state will have to be transferred into a resilient economy. And you mentioned the green and the, the digital transformation. Uh, rightly, and these are important priorities for the next uh, multinational financial framework and the recovery plan. At the same time, what we see is that uh, the budgetary positions of the member states are worsening very much. Um, the, the deficit of the, the public deficit uh, is getting close to 10% in average in many member states, above average, uh, sorry, above 10% of the GDP. Uh, one day we will have to uh, plan how we come back to the three percent target, which probably will not be tomorrow. I'm, I'm just wondering whether uh, there are or are there any internet thinkings about uh, how to start planning to come back to normal. As I as I I would like to emphasize that I understand that it it cannot be under the Portuguese presidency, but we see that we need to have sooner or later a plan to come back to normal to normal life and normal conditions. And uh, this will be a very sensitive issue. And I think the timeline should be very cautiously designed. I'm just wondering, wondering whether you have seen any thinking or reflection about uh, the plans, about the timelines, when in three, four, five years, uh, we would plan to come back to, to the normal uh, stability and growth uh, conditions. Uh, by respecting the the three percent, and when I said uh, one, two, three, four, five years, I'm just uh, it, it, this is just showing how much uncertain am I also about uh, about this issue. If you have any views about it, uh, even personal views um, under the Chatham, Chatham House rules, uh, I appreciate. Oh, thank you. Well, I'm not an economist, and I'm talking to economists, so <laughs> I'm losing in this. No <laughs> <laughs> I'm losing in this game. I think that the, the 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 first step in order to to go the the way that you have suggested is to mitigate the effects the economic effects of this crisis implementing the financial framework and the new generation programs. Um, I think that the national plans that will be uh, that will come to the surface, uh, the priorities that each member state will allocate to those funds. I think it's uh, it, it's a way for for the future uh, to ensure the recovery of the small and medium-sized uh, enterprises. I think that's, uh, for instance, I think it's a bit like, um, like the Hungarian economy. The Portuguese economy lives off small or micro micro small and medium sized uh, so it's uh, it's a it's a sector which is uh, debilitated right now and it's 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 a need of liquidity and it's it, it's in need of a strategy of uh, of recovery so uh, we place a lot of importance in all these plans that are going to be that are going to implement it which will surely uh, bring a bit of life to to all this uh, to all this sector and then there are other aspects of the monetary Union, which uh, uh, which which have to be 
be or can be implemented like a banking union like capital markets uh, effective ta taxation uh, um, the fight against tax fraud it's something which happens uh, a lot also in portugal tax evasion a customs union i mean these are all ideas which uh, w which are for the future um restoring uh, deepening the the internal market uh, strengthening public policies in the in the social and, and health areas promoting sustainable tourism um uh, strengthening the role of uh, social and, and 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 territorial cohesion uh, policies uh, it's a strategy for for the outermost uh, outermost regions uh, the green deal the digital transition these are all aspects which will uh, have an impact on the future of the union uh, a strategic autonomy a strategic industrial autonomy i mean what we have seen now for instance in terms of vaccinations and this is my my personal uh, uh, my personal opinion uh, uh, this vaccination crisis that we are living right now is a lot due to brexit because uh, the european union counted on the counted on the research and the innovation uh, polls in the united kingdom and funded them quite well and suddenly we lost them and uh, now we have to negotiate with them to buy things so uh, europe needs to to look at its deficiencies in in crucial sectors of uh, of the of the economy we we need to have a new industrial strategy we need to uh, to promote uh, uh, a real strategic autonomy which we don't have right now uh, right now if we are going to have to beg uh, to to Pfizer's and to uh, and to AstraZeneca's and all that for for doses of vaccines it's because Europe does not have a strategic autonomy so uh, we need to look at this very seriously and pursue uh, and pursue measures which will uh, will address these uh, these deficiencies we have uh, deficiencies we need to diversify our value chains and uh, i'm not thinking about china we use china as a uh, as a uh, as something to scare but uh, the problem is not there the problem is uh, us we need to diversify what is going on we need to diversify our value chains we need to reduce uh, our enormous dependence on critical goods and technology and again this pandemic has shown that uh, europe uh, despite uh, its strong language uh, in many in many things uh, it is dependent on critical things and critical technology in a very serious way so uh, the promotion of research, the promotion of innovation, I mean, these are all things that have to be addressed uh, looking at the future. Uh, because one thing that this pandemic um, has shown, and please uh, don't uh, understand me wrongly, is that uh, Europe is not as strong as it it is as it said it it is as it thought it is. Uh, we are very frail in many sectors, and we need to address them as quickly as possible. I'm not talking about necessarily the Portuguese presidency, but these are issues which um, Europe needs to look at uh, very seriously and very urgently also. Thank you, I, I, share, um, I share your views. Yes, uh, just um, coming uh, up, uh, coming back to what you said, I, I think we, we cannot agree more that there are crucial sectors, crucial industries. Uh, there are uh, very sensitive issues about uh, autonomy, strategic autonomy. What does it mean? Um, um, if, if, if we come down a bit to, to the Hungarian reality, uh, and you know the country already very well. Uh, no, unfortunately, I only know Budapest. <laughs> I arrived <laughs> I arrived. I went. I went to Jord one 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 time, but I've been most of the time here in Budapest, unfortunately, due to all this. So I exp I hope to be able to, to um, to travel a bit more in the near future. Uh, I am. I am sorry to hear that. Yeah, but I understand that the difficult. I mean, um, the conditions are not ideal uh, to get around the country. But uh, but uh, but I'm sure that uh, you are familiar that the, you are familiar with the main features of the. 
of the economy and the industries. We have um, a car industry, um, energy industry, pharmaceutical industries. I'm just mentioning those industries which can be quite sensitive to, to green transition, to strategic autonomy. How do you see what would be what would be the opportunities uh, for Hungary in this changing uh, world? Well, I think that Hungary is, I mean, uh, uh, a big bone of Hungary is its geographical situation. So uh, uh, it is, uh, it will always be uh, an important hub for, for many, many industries in, uh, in Europe. Uh, it has sectors, I think, listen, for instance, uh, the agriculture, we talked about agriculture a moment ago. I mean, there is nothing, uh, your soil must be extremely rich because uh, going to a market here in Hungary is a delight to the eyes because all the vegetables, everything, your wines, I mean, everything that comes from the earth is, uh, is extremely rich and uh, top, top quality. So I think that the uh, agricultural uh, industry is something in which uh, Hungary should bet a lot on. Uh, and then all the industries, all the heavy industries, the car. So I mean, uh, like I said, the geography makes Hungary important in Europe, as it has always been during uh, during the centuries. Uh, so uh, I don't think it's, uh, it's it will be too difficult for Hungary to find uh, a way out of this mess. To be quite honest, I think uh, I think with the entrepreneurship and with the resilience of the Hungarian people, I think that uh, uh, that there are many ways for your economy to uh, to come back to speed. Thank you, Your, Your Excellency, and uh, happy to hear that you uh, are optimistic about. Uh, but the the I'm going to ski in Epleni. I'm going to Epleni to ski. <laughs> I will visit a bit more of your country. <laughs> That's very kind. Um, colleagues, I'm looking around whether there are any other questions. If there are no more questions, and we are very disciplined because we planned this discussion for one hour, but uh, I have someone amongst us, uh, Your Excellency, who would like to say a few words to you. Very good. Uh, he's he's the, the president of our association, Mr. Dura Plesinger. Uh, Mr. President, may I give the floor to you? Um, that's a fact, but it's not. I'm sorry, I can't start my my video on that. Oh, uh, I, I did it. So, um, thank you very much, Chairman and Excellency. Thank you very much indeed for accepting the invitation and uh, addressing us on the request the agenda and on your views in relation to the, to the questions. Uh, from our side, we certainly keep our fingers crossed for its success. And, uh, and it would be most nice to have you at some time in the course of Senate uh, or, or even after that, uh, so as to see how your agenda goes and uh, how successful it will be. Um, on top of that, should you be interested in any of our programs? You know, we usually have more than 100 programs a year, would, and uh, some of them are in English. But I understand you speak Hungarian as well. <laughs> would be more than happy to invite you to join. So thank you again for the time you have devoted to us this afternoon. And thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Gabor, for organizing this very interesting event. And uh, thank you for all for listening. Thank you very much again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your words. I mean, I'm uh, I'm uh, I'm at your disposal to for anything that you wish to involve me in, and I'm not in confinement. So uh, if there is a visit that uh, you would like to suggest, uh, I'm here and willing to to meet anyone personally. No problem. So maybe maybe Gabor could give you some uh, some hints on which programs could be could make any sense to you or very good you know, yeah could, could uh, put you on, on our mailing list and then very good. 
Very good. Nadja and you. Köszönöm szépen. Excellent. <laughs> many thanks. Many thanks for your openness, uh, Your Excellency. And uh, I'm checking one once more. I don't see any other questions. So, Your Excellency, many thanks for having joined us. It was a very interesting discussion. We appreciated very much your time and your views. Uh, I also like that sometimes you shared with us your personal views, not just the, uh, the official program of the presidency, much appreciated. And uh, I hope to see you um, at any other event and meet you personally one day. When you come to Budapest, come say something and we, we will meet. I will as soon as there is a flight. I ah! <laughs> um, so, Senhor Ambassador, Senhor Ambassador, muito obrigado. Muito obrigado por ter aceitado o seu convite. E tudo sucesso para, para a presidência portuguesa. Muito obrigado. All the success to Hungary, all the success to Europe. I mean, it's all we need. It's, uh, we need. it's a semester of uh, recovery. <laughs> okay, many thanks again. Thank you very much. The best. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.